have one of those conversations where you find yourself asking the question, whatever happened to, and you fill in the blank of whoever it was, anybody ever been there before? Uh, or somebody, you've been in a room where somebody's asked that question. Uh, it might be one of those friends from high school that you never caught up with, but then you had this memory or you were telling the story and you're like, I wonder what happened to so-and-so. Uh, whatever became of their life, what did they go on to do? Or, or maybe uh, it's a public figure uh, that uh, was very public and then all of a sudden was not anymore and whatever happened to her. Maybe it was that childhood actor from that favorite TV sitcom that you had when you were uh, younger and like they grew up and and like whatever happened to so and so and so we ask that question sometimes and we wonder about um, wonder kind of how did the story play out and and what what became of it and last week uh, when we wrapped up the conversation in John chapter 3 between Jesus and Nicodemus we asked the question whatever did happen to Nicodemus after that conversation if you remember a few weeks ago we started into the the series, and we talked about Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jewish people, part of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, as it were, is kind of the best analogy I can uh, think of. Um, he was curious about Jesus. He'd seen enough, he'd heard enough, and he came to Jesus under cover of darkness to ask a few questions and to have a conversation. And in the middle of that, he says to Jesus, look, no one can do the things that you're doing, the signs that you're performing, unless God is with them. And so there is something about you. you we, we are convinced, me and a few others, we're convinced that you are from God. Um, and then Jesus simply says to him, look, Nicodemus, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you have to be born again or born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus goes on to ask a few more questions, and how can this be, and how can this be so, and all of his categories of thinking about things seem to be disturbed or blown up or shaken around, and, and Jesus simply says to them, you remember the story about Moses in the wilderness and how he lifted up the snake when the serpents came and uh, were biting the people and they were dying, and if you look to the serpent on the pole, if you looked up, then they would be healed, and he says, in the same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up, and and by extension, the application is that those who look to him would find their healing. Those who look to him by faith would be forgiven. And so then we have recorded for us by John this statement of that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And, and John kind of gives us this description of kind of in a nutshell the gospel and the reason why Jesus came into this world. But then if you are reading the story in the text, it kind of comes to an abrupt end. We have this statement about God loving the world and light and darkness and, and those kinds of things. And then at the very end of it, it just simply moves on to the next thing. Jesus and his disciples are now somewhere else. And, and, and we never hear the end of the conversation with Nicodemus. We never hear Nicodemus's response. We never hear uh, if anything shifted in Nicodemus's heart. We don't know if he left kind of wondering. We don't know if Jesus said, look, I'm, I'm getting tired now. It's time for me to go to sleep. You need to go home. Or we don't know if Nicodemus kind of found some excuse to leave because he wasn't sure or was a little bit uncomfortable. Or, or, or we don't know if Nicodemus made great promises or, or said, can we meet up again sometime? We, we just don't know. We're left hanging with what happened with that conversation. So whatever happened to Nicodemus? As far as that conversation goes, we don't know, but there are a couple other times that he shows up in John's gospel, and I want to kind of uh, settle into a couple of those stories this morning. The first time that this happens that we hear of Nicodemus again is in chapter 7, and it's a moment where uh, if you were here before Christmas and we talked about the statement from Jesus that I am the light of the world, do you remember that? And we talked about the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles 
tabernacles and, and how Jesus makes that statement during this really important feast. Well, this is where Nicodemus shows up again. It's on that same day, but a little bit of a different part of it. We mentioned it in passing, but let me kind of circle back around it again for us uh, this morning, just in case you've forgotten or weren't here. In chapter 7, verse 37, uh, we read these words. So on the last day of the feast, the great day, now there's going to be more, but just hang on. So the feast, again, is the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths that happened during the harvest season. So it's more into the, to the fall and and, uh, and so we have, uh, th- during this season, there's eight days of celebration that's happening in the city of Jerusalem. And the Feast of Booths uh, was the third of three annual pilgrimages that Jewish people were expected to come to Jerusalem for. And so they would show up uh, earlier in the year for Passover and for Pentecost, uh, you know, just a couple months later-ish. And now we have the Feast of Booths that's happening. And the Feast of Booths was a unique festival or feast or, or celebration, that, again, that lasted eight days that was unique in this way, that it wasn't specifically just for the Jewish people. It was that all nations and all peoples were invited to come to celebrate, to worship, and to pray. It had very much a, an inclusive that we're inviting literally the world to join us at this feast. And with it came this anticipation. It was almost like a, a prequel or a pre-celebration of an age that was going to come where all nations would come uh, in God's established kingdom to worship him. And so with this future promise of God in mind, there is a present celebration that incorporates some of those themes of what's going to happen and draws them into the present moment in in anticipation of that, but also in celebration and an affirmation of hope and of faith that what God has promised will come to pass during what we might call the messianic age the age of the Messiah, the day when he arrives and establishes God's kingdom. And so during the Feast of Booths, what would happen is people would build these temporary shelters and they would be set out, um, especially in the city, on porches um, and and in kind of more public places, on patios and balconies. People would go into these booths to eat and sometimes to sleep. Um, And what it was for them was a reminder of the wilderness wandering of the people when they left Egypt during the Exodus event and for 40 years lived in temporary shelters in the wilderness. That was part of the theme of it. So it's a reliving in some ways of this event of their ancestors. But in the midst of this practice became this understanding and a reminder of God's presence and provision for his people during those years. And so that was so, so important. And and there was a connection to our present that, that God is with us and God provides for us. Now, during this feast of tabernacles, uh, through those eight days, there would be specific ceremonies that would take place. And one of those ceremonies was a water ceremony. And so each day, uh, a priest would head down from the Temple Mount and go down the steps and all the way down to the Pool of Siloam, uh, which is just kind of at the bottom. And um, there's a lot of connected pieces to that, which we won't get into this morning. They go down the pool of Siloam. They would draw a jar of water out, and this jar of water would be carried all the way back up to the temple, and it would be taken into the temple courts, and it would be poured out either on or around the altar. That's what the, the so this water ceremony, this water would be, would be poured out. And there was a couple things, again, connected to it. This is a great significance. It wasn't just kind of a thing that somebody thought, hey, we should dump water on an altar, you know, every day of the week is kind of a, kind of a fun thing to do. No, there's a lot of connected tissue again to it. In Numbers chapter 20, if you recall, during the wilderness event, what was provided for the people in the, in the wilderness? Water, right, from a rock. And a couple different occasions this, this happened. And so the water ceremony was, again, connected to the provision of water in the wilderness whereby God provided water for the people. And so they would bring this water up and they would dump it out. And it was, again, a recalling of that. But there was also connected pieces to a prophecy in Zechariah 14, which again, this morning, I don't want to take the time to kind of work all the way through that.
that. But Zechariah chapter 14 is a prophetic psalm that speaks to, again, the days of renewal. It speaks of uh, water. It speaks of um, just coming to worship God and, and the promise of God that's all connected to, to what's happening. And Zechariah 14 will be read regularly during this time. And so it's, it's connected with God's provision of rain during the harvest. So not only of the, of the wilderness reminder, the water from the wa- rock, but the present harvest and God's the supplier of rain. And so, so all these things are wound up in this water ceremony. But on the last day of the feast, this procession would happen seven times. So not only did the priest get down once and bring up a jug of water, happened seven times, and people would gather to watch this, and as the jug got carried up, people would kind of line the steps, and there would be singing, and there would be this great procession of, you know, the water jug being carried, and, and it, was a, it was a big thing. And again, the whole thing, along with the light ceremony that happened in the evening, came to be a celebration of God's future restoration of Israel, the extension of his salvation to the nations, and the arrival of the Messiah. Okay, so we got, got a kind of a picture of what's going on now during the festival on the feast day, the last day of the feast, the great day when the seven water pitchers are carried up and there's expectation and there's thinking ahead and God's going to provide and what he's doing and he's already provided and all of this is wound up in what's happening. And then in verse 37, we keep reading, it says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Is it like, again, same with like, I'm the light of the world. It's not a statement made in isolation. It's not a statement he just kind of comes up with one day and says, here's how I can, you know, sometimes uh, how do we talk about the kingdom of God? What can we compare it to? It's kind of like this. No, no, this is a, this is a, in the middle of a significant moment, just ripe with symbolism and expectation. Jesus stands up and says, if anyone is thirsty, again, borrowing the prophetic imagery from the ceremony and the festival and the scriptures, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Not up the steps to the temple, but to me and drink All of this future expectation is happening through me. And whoever believes in me, Jesus says, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Again, this is allusions to that very scripture, probably Zechariah 14, because it's not a direct quote, but it incorporates pieces of the imagery. And, And the claim that Jesus is making in this moment is significant. He's saying, I am the source of life, which is a claim that only truly God could make. If anyone's thirsty, come to me, and whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow living water. Now, John gives us a little bit of commentary on it just to help us understand a little bit more and interprets Jesus' words, so he kind of plays the role of a preacher. And this is what he says uh, in, the, in the next verses, verse 39 and 40. He says, now, now this Jesus said about the Spirit. This is the water that's going to be poured out. He's talking about the Spirit through uh, whom those who believed in him were to receive. So the Spirit's going to be promised and and given and poured out, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so John's trying to make the connection and the extension that, that look, this idea of out of you will flow living water, that the Spirit of God will eventually be poured out like the water from the ceremony. And again, this is all kinds of connected scriptures to it. It's going to be poured out on, on one day. And, but at this point, the Spirit had not yet been poured out. Why? Because Jesus had not yet been glorified, that is, risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. So if you follow the story of scriptures, you know how this works, right? Jesus eventually is crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, ascended, and then a few weeks later at Pentecost, which is where we celebrate Pentecost now, the Spirit is poured out. And so John is just saying, look, Jesus isn't 
Jesus is telling the truth in that if anyone's thirsty, come to me, and from me will flow living water. But John says, but Jesus is talking here about the fact that the Spirit has a role to play in this too. And so what John is doing for us in his commentary is tying together the work of Jesus through whom we have access to God and the work of the Holy Spirit in a new era that is about to come through his life, death, and resurrection. You see that? See the, are you tracking, tracking with me there? I know I'm saying a lot of stuff this morning, but just, just stick with me because this is all going somewhere. Um, so, so he's tying this all together, and as expected now, Jesus' words about coming to him for that living water result in contrasting opinions and responses. It draws some skeptics And some who are willing to believe, it draws those who are hostile. There's all kinds of responses, and this is how it plays out. It says, when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. So they're trying to now draw connections to the promised Messiah. Other people said, this is the Christ. This really is the Messiah. No, this is the forerunner. This is the one who's announcing the, 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 the Messiah. No, no, no. No, this is the Messiah. And so there's already some discussion. And then somebody said, but, but isn't it true that the Messiah is supposed to, he doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Like that, he's not from that region. He's supposed to be born somewhere else, isn't it? And Jesus, isn't he from Galilee? And so, so there becomes this discussion. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? And so there is division among the people over him. And people weren't quite sure what to make of his message. And is what he's saying true? And should we believe him? Or, or well, let's go back to the scriptures. And, it, well, he's from Galilee and doesn't say he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And it seems that some people didn't know he was actually born in Bethlehem, even though he was raised and started his ministry now in Galilee. And so, so there's all kinds of different opinion and discussion and questions. But one of the things that sticks out that's really interesting is that some of them, not so much concerned about is what's, you know, how do we understand what he's saying, but some of them wanted to arrest him. Whether because of his claim or just because of the fact that there's things going on here that are now being interrupted. But no one dared lay hands on him. And so the officers, when they came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who had said to him, they said, why did you not bring him to us? The desire to arrest him is most likely motivated by the chief priests and Pharisees. And so now the officers of the temple come back and they don't have Jesus in hand. And they say, where is he? And the officers answered, no one has ever spoke like this man. To which the Pharisees and the chief priests look at them and say, we don't care how he's speaking. We asked you to bring him to us. But, but they're saying, no, no, no. There's something about him that no one's ever talked like him. There's something about him that, that's given us pause. And then the response comes back to them. And get this. Let's just track with this. Verse 47. The Pharisees answered, have you been deceived? Don't tell us that you're convinced he's someone special. Don't tell us you've been tricked into something that's not true. Don't tell us that. Listen, have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? Has any of us who, who are in any official capacity, the religious scholars, the rulers of the people, those, those who know the scriptures, those who should understand the expectations, like, like should, have any of us kind of said, yes, we're giving him the welcome. We're rolling out the carpet. He's the one we've been waiting for. Has any of us thrown in our lot with him? To which the answer is obviously no. But this crowd, they say, that does not know the law is accursed. In other words, their ignorance, this crowd, their ignorance and their ineptitude will lead them to a bad end. And then that's where we find our guy, Nicodemus. Nicodemus who we've talked about, here's right in the middle of this whole tension. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before under the cover of darkness at night, a different time, and who was one of them, that is the Pharisees, the chief priests, the rulers, he said to his company, does our law, by extension, by the way, the same law 
that you're citing that this crowd is accursed by. Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Is that how we act? Is that what's been prescribed to us, that we just jump to conclusions and, and, and we kind of determine things based on what we want and, and, and we kind of use the law in the way that, you know, it's helpful for us when we want it to be? Does our law judge a man without first giving him hearing and, and learning what he does? This isn't a direct defense of Jesus. It's not even a personal confession. It's just simply an asking for consideration that we give it a fair shake that we seek to understand first, and he's laying it out there. But then some of his company say to him, look, are you from Galilee too? Which is what? Just an insult. <laughs> like, like it's just kind of a backhanded comment. And then he says, search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee, of that region in the north. Now, charitably, we could say that no prophet arises from Galilee. They technically mean the Messiah. But if you want to be technical about it, there are prophets who have arisen in Galilee. Most notably, Elijah and Jonah are two. And so, so it's, so it's, so their argument about no prophet arises from Galilee just simply isn't true in a technical sense. And if you want to be technical, Jesus actually isn't from Galilee. He was born in Bethlehem, just as the scriptures said. And so it's interesting that when Nicodemus says, shouldn't we just give this a fair shake? Shouldn't we first hear what he has to say? Shouldn't we at least examine the evidence that could be before us? The response is a one-liner and an insult as if those two things just simply settled everything. You've never experienced that before in your life, have you? <laughs> Where there's some big thing going on and somebody just makes some kind of offhanded comment with a one-liner and a, oh, I got this uh, one thing over here and that just kind of settles the whole matter. Why are we even talking about this anymore? Like, th but this is what's happening. Now, the next time Nicodemus shows up is in chapter 19. Again, what Mitch read for us, and I won't go back over the whole thing, but it follows when Jesus was betrayed and crucified. His body has not yet been removed from the cross, and so it's late in the day, on the day of his crucifixion. In chapter 19, verse 38, let's read that again. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who is a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, and so he came and took away his body. Now, Joseph of Arimathea, what we know of him is he is a council member as well, just like Nicodemus. In fact, Luke uh, actually tells us in his record of these events that Joseph, uh, not only was he a council member, but he did not consent to the decision about having Jesus crucified. He actually was one of the Sanhedrin he said, no, 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 this isn't the right course of action. This is not what we ought to do with Jesus. And so Joseph, who is a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because again, here he is in the middle of the tension. He holds a certain position, but also a certain conviction. And there are people around him who do not necessarily share that same conviction, but he still remains for the moment in that position. And so he is a secret disciple of Jesus, but out of fear, and the reason why it's secret is it's because of fear of what might happen to him. And so he goes and asks Pilate for the body of Jesus so that Jesus' body wouldn't just simply be thrown into the city trash heap like the other criminals who would not have family to come and to give them a proper burial. Oftentimes that was even frowned upon for those who are crucified should not be given a proper burial. But Joseph goes and asks. And then in verse 39, there's our guy again who shows that Nicodemus also, who earlier came to Jesus by night. John just goes out of his way to point that out each time he mentions Nicodemus. Um, working now alongside of Joseph, he came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. Either he was a tough guy or had a wheelbarrow 
or an entourage. I'm not sure. But here he comes. And they take the body of Jesus and they bound it in linen cloths with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. What they do is they honor Jesus in death. And they're not even Jesus' family. These two guys, priests, members of the council, elders of the people, Pharisees, here, here they show up in this during the time of Passover, which would have meant that handling a dead body would have rendered them ceremonially unclean for seven days, which meant the most holy day of the year, the most important celebration of their people, of, of the Passover meal and the Passover event, they would have to step aside from. And so here they are, burying the body of Jesus. Verse 41, John tells us that now it was in the place where he was crucified, that there was a garden, and then that garden was a new tomb which no one had yet been laid. This description that John gives us is one that should, for his hearers, tell them that it's a tomb that only the very wealthy could afford, which Jesus was not. And this set the stage for one of the most important apologetics of our faith, that he was buried in an identifiable place so his resurrection could not be confused with the wrong spot. And so, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. And that is the last that we hear in Nicodemus. He's mentioned two more times after John 3 in those two places. Once in a question of what a strong statement Jesus, ma Jesus makes during the water ceremony on the great day of the feast. And the second is at his death when he helps Joseph bury the body. And so when it comes to the question of whatever happened to, sorry to disappoint, <laughs> but we don't have a whole lot to go on. We're not really 100% sure. Some have rendered a verdict that they call Nicodemus a coward. Some have come to that conclusion that if he was a disciple like Joseph, it was secret. He wasn't willing to kind of be so bold as to stand in front of the Sanhedrin and tell them what's what and why they should believe in Jesus. And he wasn't so bold to go public with his face. He just kind of hid by in the shadows secretly and it makes him a coward. There were others who would call him a faithful convert who kind of take a different view that Nicodemus, like Joseph, lived within the tension of his position and his conviction where, where he actually was a follower of Jesus who came to put his faith in Jesus that, that eventually, you know, this, this is the, the life that he lived to, who his faith was ultimately in Jesus, faithful convert. And while the scriptures, I guess, only give us pieces of his story and certainly, and I think most importantly, nothing after the resurrection, here's what I see about Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a man who moves from curiosity to openness to association with Jesus. He comes to Jesus first because he's curious about the signs that are being done, but he comes to him under the cover of darkness at night, but he's curious enough to be open to hearing him out, to having the conversation, to trying to at least learn what he says and observe what he does. And that openness toward Jesus led him to a place of association with Jesus by honoring him in his death. And we've got to remember, this is all happening in real time. Nicodemus doesn't have kind of the luxury, if we could put it that way, of, of coming to the end of the whole thing and then looking back and drawing a conclusion. He's doing it as everything is unfolding. And while the question of whatever happened to might be interesting to speculate about for Nicodemus, 
John doesn't really satisfy us with an answer. But I wonder if part of the reason why he does not, I wonder if part of the reason why he doesn't is so that we don't miss the wider, perhaps even more important question that John is asking. And the question is, what about you? What about you? Because we can talk about Nicodemus all day. And we can try to draw our own conclusions. And we can try to figure out whether Nicodemus actually was a follower of Jesus, whether he would see the kingdom of God in the end, whether he would be born of the Spirit. We could, we could try to figure all of that out, but that's not John's point. John's point is simply this. What about you? Are you curious enough? Are you willing enough to, to, to figure out answers to the questions that you have? Are you bold enough to ask those questions about Jesus? Is anyone here thirsty? Is any of us ready to take the next step? Is any of us willing to trust and follow him? Because if you look just to the next page, and I, usually in the Gospel of John, I've, I've mentioned this so many times, in chapter 20 at the end it says this, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. Perhaps even some of those Nicodemus saw or heard about that, that John does not record for us. He just didn't take the time to write them down. In fact, in another place he says, Jesus did so many things, there wouldn't be enough room in the whole world for all the books that would, we would have to write to record all the things that he said and did. But here's what John does tell us. He says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which aren't written in this book. John would say, by which I am one of those disciples who saw those things. But these ones I've written, these in this book I've written, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. I've written these down so that you wouldn't have to spend your time wondering about Nicodemus and the crowds that followed and who was there when he was crucified, and who left at the cross, and then who stayed after, and who came back, and whatever happened to the guy who was blind and was healed, and the people that their lives were changed because of the miracles and, that Jesus did and the signs that he performed. Man, all those things I've written down for you so that you can marvel at the person of Jesus, that at your marveling at who he is, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that you might believe something about who he is and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. That really, I've written this for you, that you would have life in Jesus' name, that you would be convinced about who Jesus is and that by faith you would come to know that life, that you might see the kingdom of God. And church, to us gathered, to anyone who hears this word, may we be found trusting and following Jesus. May we be found chasing after him all of our lives. And may the answer to the question of whatever happened to you, if that ever gets asked someday, may it be known that your life was defined by that pursuit of him. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that sometimes you don't answer all of our questions. God, that sometimes you don't satisfy all of our curiosities. But that you give us enough to know what is required, what it means to have life in your name. 
We thank you that you've promised a kingdom and that you've promised that we can experience that kingdom, that we would have a part to play in that kingdom, that we would see that kingdom come in all of its fullness. And God, I pray this morning for us that our lives might be found in pursuit of following Jesus because it's in his name and believing that he is the Christ, the son of God, that, that we, by faith in what he has accomplished through his death on the cross and his resurrection, that you've poured out your spirit and that, that God, your spirit does something in us to change our hearts, to make us new. And God, we plead with you that, that your spirit would be at work in the hearts and lives of people around us in this community that we would, that they would take out and reach, re, take out and take, reach out and take hold of the life that's offered in Christ. I pray this morning that as, that as we consider our own lives and not simply get so caught up in the lives of what everybody else is doing or thinking or, or who went where or was doing what, but that in our lives we might be found in pursuit of you. And so I pray this morning that that, that would be true of us. For those who are thirsty, may they find their soul's thirst quenched in Jesus. For those who need to take a first step of faith, I pray that that first step of faith would be taken. They'd have the courage to do that today. And that for all of us, we might know life in your name. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.